What up, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Nerd Gen Review, where we'll be talking about the season finale of the Loki series. Um, Brian. By the way, I'm your host, Pablo, and joining me as always is Mr. Brian Schultz. And, and uh, man, I'm excited about the season finale of Loki and how it ended, what we, we, what we were introduced to what the possibilities are, which are endless. This was, a, for me, a very satisfying um, episode. Uh, what were your thoughts on this, uh, on this, on the introduction of what we thought was the most we were going to get was a, a tease at the end. And we ended up getting pretty much a whole episode uh, with this version of Kang the Conqueror. What were your thoughts on this? Yeah, that sound you hear is the Marvel plane <laughs> landing finally, but landing on the launch pad and blasting back off into space. Yes. I mean, full mark. This, I think what they pulled off in this episode was incredibly, incredibly hard. And I was... I think I texted you. I was like, I almost fell off the couch <laughs> when the big reveal came within the first five minutes of the episode. And I said, wow, they are going for this. Yeah, yeah. And then to see how they really balanced giving you some resolution to the season. as And then at the same time, blowing the doors off to what's to come. It was really well done and not easy to do. And we get, we'll get into a lot of the details as to why, mm -hmm. but I'm super excited about a lot of the things in this episode. And, you know, we talked about it along the way, but hats off to Michael Waldron and Kate Heron because I don't think people understand how difficult what they did in these six episodes was. And I think it's one of these series that like, we are going to come back to these six episodes as we go further into the multiverse. Explain to me what the difficulty was in 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 pulling off this this uh, finale. So several things. So one is if we draw the comparison to what you and I probably expected, which was the equivalent of the Thanos turning to the camera at the end of a that with all due respect to marvel that's easy in the sense of it's a really cool visual there's no backstory there's no character development there's no dialogue you don't have to prove anything with that it's mm -hmm. just an image that's super cool and iconic to introduce kang the way they did and have him not only be in the episode but he is the episode and not have it feel like it completely undermined the show you just watched. That's number one that's really hard. Mm -hmm. Because at its core, the bulk of this episode is three people sitting at a desk talking. Yeah. So that's the fact that that was compelling television, I think, is number one. Mm -hmm. I think number two is, and I go back to what we got at the beginning of this show. These are the best writers of exposition I've ever heard. Because they gave you in the first two episodes multiversal rules. Yeah. Via Miss Minutes and the TVA personnel. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't boring. Mm -hmm. And it was understandable. Mm -hmm. Kang in 10 minutes basically had to give you the entire future multivariant Kang, original multiversal war, and sort of pull the curtain back on the world you thought you were in is not the world you thought you were in. And here's where we are now. Again, without it being boring, without it being pedantic and making it understandable enough that you're like, oh, we're, we're in a we're in a whole different ball game and we're in a lot of trouble here. Basically. Yeah. That is for, for one guy who you've never seen before on screen to just walk in and deliver a speech like that and have yeah. it work, I think is like, I mean, you know, that's the Simone Biles vault that no one else can do. <laughs> and like, 
getting full scores for it. I, I couldn't believe it like when he showed up. Yeah. And I couldn't believe when he started to do those little like CGI images of yeah, the yeah, history yeah. of the world. And I was like, we're getting the entire backstory yeah. right now. And this is the first time where we can definitively say, I don't think you can watch the rest of the MCU in phase four without watching this show. Oh yeah. Cause you'll be confused out of your mind. Cause this is it. This is the textbook. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know what your thoughts were, but I was just like, I had my mouth was open the whole time watching him pull this off. What I thought about what I saw and what I heard. I mean, I've watched the episode over and over and over again, skipping to just those three sitting in at office just so that I can hear the dialogue, see the performance. And I found myself initially first when I watched it was When I first saw him, I was like, oh, snap. And I was like, OK. And and then my eyes and ears were just focused on what was what, being okay, said. What was your like instant reaction to when the door opens and you see him sitting there? And it's minute five of the episode. I was like, oh, my oh, I, I, I was like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> I was like. I was very surprised, very yep. surprised because of what we said, what uh, what we said, what we thought would happen. Um, and I think we were almost sort of banking on it. Um, I was under the impression um, before the episode aired was that, you know, comparing what WandaVision did and what we thought would be the main villain or something didn't come to pass. And again, we still think that might play out later in uh, future uh, either movies or, or, or shows. And they even made it less certain, I thought, by having Miss Minutes read them. Oh, no, that was I was scared out of my mind. It was, freaking, man, right? it was kind of scary, right? And it was like, but she's referencing him, yeah. but not in a way where you think he has to show up that minute. Yeah. yeah. And and then it, it goes to him, and I was just like, Oh wow! They really, really did it. Like yeah. they really did this. Yeah. And yeah, kept so, it secret. And kept it secret. Yeah. I mean, I mean, and we we addressed this uh, a few episodes ago when we talked about Jonathan Majors and his response when he was asked about you know yeah. him being Kang and he was like, I don't know what you're talking about. And yeah. he kept it moving, right? Um. But I was thoroughly entertained in how he a expressed himself uh, and how he told uh, the story of how all of this started and it was just very simple i'm telling you the 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 education that you're given about this universe is very simple to understand which is you know i like it. It's not, it's not Matrix uh, revelations or whatever. It's not that sort of dialogue. I like that you bring that up because I've seen a lot of comparisons to the architect online, yes. and I disagree because that was gobbledygook that didn't make <laughs> a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah. So again, I've watched the episode multiple times and I continue to watch it just because I, I enjoyed Jonathan Major's performance. Uh, I think what's interesting and, and what's exciting for me is to see other iterations of him and how differently he plays those those versions of Kang. Um, the way he presents these other variants of himself makes you be it, it makes you feel like you know wait till you see these guys so they're setting up you know very different a variants and and b very evil and i'm interested in seeing how different he's going to play those roles i think this is one of the biggest swings marvel has taken mm -hmm. since the inception of the mcu and here's why i say that we knew he was going to be in multiple pictures. Um, but 
you know, we had seen like in the case of Thanos, Thanos was in multiple pictures, but really only featured in one. Yeah. For this to work, he is going to have to be front and center over and over again, but not playing the same character. So you, you have to like him as a performer. Not saying you have to like the character. We're probably going to revile the versions of the character, but you have to like him as a performer because if it doesn't work, you're getting a lot of him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's a big vote of confidence from Kevin Feige, the Parliament, and Disney to say this is the guy who can, who has the range to play this character all sorts of different ways as we need across these projects, and have it be effective yeah. for a franchise which has had villain problems. Right, this is a definitely trying something new category. Yeah, yeah. I have to think this is also an actor's dream. Like this is the career defining performance where you're not being signed up to play one character. You're being signed up to paint with the entire palette. You yeah. can be the super villainous despot. You can be with, I want to talk about what he did in this iteration because I thought it was very jarring and it echoed a lot of different things, but it was not expected. I think whatever you thought the first iteration of Kang was going to be, I think he pulled some surprises here. Mm -hmm. um, but I also like the idea. We'll see where it goes. But as I've said, one of my bigger complaints with Marvel is they, as they grow and grow and get to these big battles is it's always these like CGI creatures, right? Who don't have a lot of personality. And I'm encouraged by the idea that it might not be that with this guy, that mm -hmm. it might be just versions of him yeah. which have more of an identity, more of a personality that the heroes have to contend with. And I think we're setting it up from the standpoint of, you know, he pretty much has everyone overmatched by an enormous amount, right? In the sense of the way he laid out the universe and this idea of like, you don't have any idea how bad things could have gone if I, if me, good Kang, wasn't here protecting you from bad Kangs. And now you're going to yeah. meet bad Kangs. Yeah. So it does lend this idea of like, who in the roster actually stands a chance against him? You know, and I think that's, you're creating those stakes in a way immediately that even Thanos, we knew Thanos was big and big scale, but, you know, as we saw, like, you know, he can certainly beat up any individual hero, but like you put like Thor plus Scarlet Witch, Captain Marvel, there were heroes that could definitely go toe to toe with him one on one. Yeah. And with this guy, it almost feels like, who is that? Because he already knows the outcome. He's already been there and done that. I think. His. I think the guy that will ultimately uh, figure it out will be Reed Richards. Um, it only makes sense be because of that. I think he, although Kang has been a, in a more of an Avengers foe, um, I think it will take Reed Richards' mind uh, to be able to, oh, oh, you know, uh, beat him. I don't think there is a mind outside of Tony Stark's that we've met that's been able to sort of figure things out. And Reed Richards is the mind that thinks way outside the box when it comes to certain things like this. And he's gonna be the, the, the guy to possibly set up, have a plan and or, or, or spontaneously figure it out in order to, to defeat him. So uh, my question to you would be, how much of Kang throughout the, the, the movies will we have? Would it be the sort of the same length of with Thanos being in the background for 10 years? I would assume that obviously you made the comparison that Thanos was only a turn and this one we got a version of Kang and almost an hour's worth of it, right? 
this is going to be a, a tall task for Jonathan Majors because he's not going to show up. Who knows what they do? But I would assume that Jonathan Majors will be have more, more screen time than Thanos did. And oh, he has to. Yeah. So I think for this to work, yeah. So how long do you think he will be uh, a part of the MCU? I think it's going to be a long time because we don't have a clear arc to a resolution of, you know, Secret Wars and the Multiversal War. We don't really have, that hasn't been given to us. That's probably, a, it's going to be phase five, not phase four. Yeah. But I think you hit on a key point, which is I think, I am hoping, I'm really hoping this, that Marvel is taking the tact that we can create drama and climaxes and showdowns that don't have to be about armies fighting armies. It can be about a chess match between human heroes or, hum or non-superpowered heroes, superpowered and magic heroes mm -hmm. opposite this kind of thinking villain, right? A villain who is not really just going to, like Thanos is still a brute strength villain. He's a smart guy, but he's a brute strength villain. This is not that. Yeah. Um, and so I think I'm, I'm fascinated to see how they work that through. But the other thing that's, you know, fun is we really don't know anything about how Kang is going to be portrayed because we there's so many versions of him, right? So it's not like when in all these other characters, when they show up on screen, you're like, okay, that's the portrayal. Mm -hmm. I think the only character that's really changed a lot is Thor. Hemsworth has played Thor differently over the mm -hmm. course of his time. This actually reminds me of one of your favorite things, which is Superman 3, right? It's Christopher Reeve playing bad, bad Superman versus good Superman. We haven't, since that time, we really haven't seen a lot of that where the same actor just flips and changes mm -hmm. how the same character is played. So I don't think you can necessarily look at majors in this episode and say, okay, that's the majors that's going to show up in quantum media. I don't think you have mm -hmm. any idea, which yeah. I think makes it fun. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Would you be disappointed if, if this is somehow resolved at the end of Dr. Strange two? Yeah, I would be, I would be, I, I think that, I think that everyone should be taking notes in the MCU from the way this show played it, which is it gave you that like resolution of a chapter, but not the resolution of the book. Right. And I hope that in Doc Strange 2 and Quantumania, it's that there's these self-contained battles and struggles that are resolved in the movie. But mm -hmm. then there's this broader picture narrative, which just keeps going for a long time. I mean, that's the essence of comic books anyway. So I, I really hope that it's not a, you know, three three appearances and done type of yeah. game. And I don't see how it could be, right? Multiversal war is what it is. Like, you can't resolve that. In two or three exactly. Days. Exactly. Because like, I was watching, you know, some, some shows. And although we can't, automatically assume that they're going to be going on with this storyline for 15, 20 years. But I would say that the amount of content that will be coming out will span quite some time. And the events of this show or the ending of this show seem pretty... <sighs> It was a lot in terms of, based on what we've learned, these branches, this is, this is huge. It can basically be the explanation or somewhat of the explanation that causes us to understand why certain things are the way they are with Blade obviously with Dr. Strange and perhaps other things with the Eternals, who knows? We don't know, but we do know that this is huge and cannot be resolved in a movie. Because like you, I would be very much so disappointed if this was resolved in just one movie. And 
this the, this ending has has me so much more excited um for Doctor Strange 2 and the Multiverse of Madness and the overall um universe and, and what what it what it what it will uh deliver in the in the coming years there's just so much to i guess digest and ponder cuz it's just you don't know right you don't know i think it it made me more excited for eternals as well and i'll tell you why because <clears throat> i think that if i if i go back to original avengers you know there was this effectively we're building up from individual planets and then in the battle with the chitari there was this idea of like there's this universe out there right these linkages and other planets and other worlds you know effectively it was like alien life on earth right i mean in essence i mean we, even though we knew thor had already been there this is eternals and what kang laid out in this and this loki show and WandaVision too. Mm -hmm. I think in different ways. The, the, the common theme to me is this idea of the world within the world. This like we have all lived in this micro world, this single galaxy or universe. But there's these forces that exist beyond that. And, you know, so Kang timekeepers is one of those the eternals the whole idea of we've never interfered but we've always been here watching things right uh the watcher maybe in what if and then wandavision via magic right the idea of magic is something beyond our comprehension and so now we're headed into this into that frontier and i like that because i think it really in a way helps with the players we have on the board because we have these you know you have the daredevils the spider-man the black widows the hawkeyes who you know as we know would have no chance in a fight straight up against one of these villains but when you're dealing with the micro world there's all sorts of challenges and conflicts where they're ideal to yeah. fight those battles and resolve and yeah. then when you get into the cosmic you need doc strange and you need scarlet witch and you need loki and you need, you know, to go up against the, or you need some of the Eternals to go up against the Deviants and Kanks. So I like how they set this up. There's a very much a macro and a micro, and it makes sense in the context of the powers of the different people we have on the board, which is way different than what we had 12, 13 years ago. Yeah. If you recall, and I want to ask you this, and I want to get your perspective. If you recall in the first Doctor Strange, this is not the first time we've heard of the multiverse. In the first Doctor Strange, multiverse was mentioned. So we knew it existed. Mm -hmm. And then you jump back into Infinity War where Doctor Strange is looking at these 14 million different outcomes. Right. My question to you is, how much of the multiverse do you think Dr. Strange understands and knows about how it works? Um, I would guess that between the Ancient One and Dr. Strange, their understanding is relatively limited. And it's about to get a lot bigger in, in, in Dr. Strange too. Um, it's interesting to tie it to the real world. Kevin Feige, actually, one of his quotes recently was that they had meetings even following the finale of this show to review and fine tune the rules of the universe. Yeah, 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 yeah. So course. I think, so I think if I had to guess, I would probably say Doc Strange thinks he knows a decent amount about it and is probably about to find out that he knows less than he thinks. I think that's kind of the beauty of, of the storytelling here in the same way that, you know, I think what made Loki's role in the Tom Hiddleston Loki's role in the finale very apropos is, you know, he's, he's the God of mischief. He's the ultimate trickster and he's sitting in the room and it's like, here's a kindred spirit across the way who is much better at tricks and mischief than I am and plays on a much grander scale. That's kind of what I thought was fun about that interplay where it's like, you could see his like understanding of like, I get all this. Like I, the DNA of everything you're doing is what I would do. 
yeah, but I'm yeah, just yeah. nowhere near powerful enough to to accomplish that. So, um, so I don't know. I don't. I don't know what you think, but I, I kind of feel like it's like there's all of us, the regular people and the superheroes, and then there's Ancient One and Mystic <laughs> Arts, and they have like first level understanding, and yeah, then yeah. Kang is like up, you know, yeah, six seven level. levels above yeah. that. Yeah. No, I mean, I think it will be cool to see some of the reactions to uh, that some of these heroes will have to being told what may be coming, how it all came about. Uh, there's just so much to look forward to, man. And the fact that one of the things that has me um, not so concerned about how all this will play out is the fact, and as what you just mentioned, they had a meeting to talk about the rules and how this may affect everything else. This, these meetings, these talks, these fleshing out of ideas is what, you know, and, and they're not gonna all hit, you know, we can't expect Marvel to be, and because they haven't won, and they, I'm pretty sure, the process is still either A, intact, or B, has evolved. But they haven't succeeded all the time. But I think because they do have these meetings and they have these talks, you know, gives me great, puts me at ease. And so I think there's just so much to ponder and think about what we're going to get here, man. And Dr. Strange 2 in the Multiverse of Madness, I wouldn't be surprised, man, if this... When is that supposed to come out? Next year. February. If things are back to normal, 1.5. I'm just saying, I'm just putting it out there. 1.5. This show definitely, definitely helped. You know, one other thing I liked in the Kang monologue, and he just glossed it over, um, is there was a resolution to the first go around. I think that's important, right? He, if you believe what he said, if uh, he basically was like, there was a battle and I won. He doesn't tell you how. He doesn't tell you anything about the strategy or what happened. He just, but I think it's important because as you go down this path, it, it risks being one of those like, impossible like how could you possibly solve this yeah but the fact that he said like right at the outset we went through this process before and i won mm -hmm. and the harmony you have now is the is my was part of my solution to that you're welcome I think that, I think, <laughs> yeah but i think that's important because it implies that a lot of the chess match is well we know there's a solution he did it somehow mm. somehow some way the original hang civil war ended with a resolution and peace and harmony, sort of. Mm -hmm. So there has to be a solution. I think that's really important. Whereas keeping it totally open-ended, you're kind of like, well, how could you possibly bring this around? Because he seems literally unbeatable. When you put it that way, what comes to mind is all these different characters and all these different realities and multiverses, right? And ultimately, some of these characters from different uh, realities won't, won't survive. Because in, in, in from what I can tell, if they choose to resolve it to how Immortus, and Immortus is, is, is the version of Kang that we got in, in, Lo, in Loki, if they choose to resolve it in, in his fashion, having just one timeline and making sure that timeline doesn't split, It'll be interesting what the resolution of this will be um, when you sort of think about all these other iterations, because we'll all have to, to, I mean, you can't imagine that if they do a secret war, wars, Captain, Captain America is, is going to be, in, is not going to be involved. He may not be from this reality. He, may, might, he might be from a different one, which gives him the out when it's done. Right. Well, there's. I also have 
I have suspicion there will be some rules that qualify who can come back and in what capacity. Like there is finality to life for yeah. some of these, like in a way that remember, like with the snap, they're like, we can't bring Black Widow back, even though technically you ought to have been able to based on that. Mm -hmm. There was that reference to. So I think a lot of the rules parsing is in part because people, the fans will start asking, well, where's Chris Evans? Where's RDJ? Like, and then they have to be able to explain in context, there's like a multiversal impact to some of your decisions that like sometimes you can do things that basically cut off all of the, you know, existence, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's, that's all going to be sort of to come. Um, but I, as I said, I just think, I think they really set this up as like as as like a puzzle, like much more of a mental game, like much more of a oh, yeah. like a thriller detective mystery as opposed to a straight like sci-fi action progression. We'll see if they carry it through, but that's what it feels like to me right now. Mm -hmm. That finale was a great finale. It, I have to go back to episode five because let's talk about the episode a little bit. Mm -hmm. Really smart decision to have classic Loki versus Elioth kind of be the big special effects showdown. Have that in episode five. Don't have that at the end because it was never the strength of the character. Yeah. We talked about it before. We wanted to see the climax being more of like a mental match wits type. I don't know if we totally got there, mm -hmm. but it was all dialogue. Yeah, yeah. It was not action. It was dialogue. It was character that drove the finale and it really worked. Yeah. It really worked. Whereas in episode three, it didn't kind of true a little bit slower there maybe a little too maybe it was the one episode that for us fell flat a little bit too minimalist but mm -hmm. but i think in the end like you know the two loki's having their moment mobius having kind of his own sort of trajectory you know and then tom hiddleston at the very end of the show kind of having that planet of the apes callback of like he thinks he's back in the tva but he's in a different tva we don't know what multiverse he's in but he's definitely changed um, timelines um it, it all worked and like the only mm -hmm. really action you got was that mini duel between loki and sylvie but that was really just to drive home the point of how the two loki variants view the world differently even as they like each other so yeah i have two thoughts one has to do with like Secret Invasion and that whole storyline because that, that one seems to be or will be a huge situation. Um, don't know whether or not that Disney uh, show will resolve itself within the Disney show and not end in a film. But my thoughts are this. Is it possible and I'm just throwing this out there, that at the end of all this, given that, you know, Chris, obviously Chris Evans is not going to be Captain America forever. Obviously, Robert Downey Jr. is gone. Black Widow is gone. And some of these other characters will be gone after some time. Do we get to a point where everything resets at the end of this? So I think you're, well, I think you're hitting on something which is interesting, which is, the premise up until now has been, if you go by the Ancient One discussion with Bruce Banner and Endgame, it's this idea of restoration. It's this idea of you can't change too much because you have to put things back. And I guess the question I'm saying is why? I'm not convinced going forward that the resolution of this is the restoration or reset of the timeline we were on. Resolution could very well be finding peace and harmony in a new branch that is the best outcome of the ones available. I think that's out there for Marvel to play with. And in that case, it would open the door for how do you bring, where does a new Iron Man, a new actual Iron Man come from? Where does a new actual Captain America come from? It could be done that way. And you'd be at that point, honestly, 15, 20 years out, people would be ready for, you know, they'd be oh, ready yeah. for someone else to, of to actually play the same character with the same name, but be in a different world. I think they'd be totally, and the, totally in, in, Yeah, in a different set of circumstances, of course. Yeah. Um, going back to the, the episode, what were your thoughts on 
how the episode began because this was way different than anything that we've ever seen before. But obviously that introduction was sort of giving us an idea of how some of this works, right? What were your thoughts on what you saw in that, those, that the first two minutes of hearing those voices and seemingly coming out from one universe and into another? Yeah, no, I think this episode, this show has been really smart with all of the kind of ways it's interplayed with that. So did not, you know, they kind of did some episodes, they use just the straight Marvel intro. Sometimes they use a song. In this case, they use the audio callbacks to scenes we all knew and remembered, but they were mixed, you know, and remixed in a way. Mm-hmm. Um, and we jumped right into it. You know, we went, we basically really picked up where we left off um, with sort of like the house or the Citadel at the end of time um so no i i like the choice i thought like i said i like the choice i like the progression to miss minutes who the the actress who voiced miss minutes had teased there was something else her character was going to do and i would say that that delivered right to have her sort of i don't know it, it just made it when we cut back to the tva and miss minutes then popped up and told Ravona, oh, sorry, I was dealing with something else. You're like, oh, <laughs> like she's a lot more sinister. And the, and like, the look in her eyes when she was yeah, saying it. The agent of Kang, right, who looks really innocent. And and so I thought that was cool. And then obviously, yeah, the, to, to, to have Jonathan Majors. Now, I don't know what you thought. I, when I, when he, he appeared just visually and his mannerisms, all I could, like the number one thing I kept thinking of was Willy Wonka. <laughs> Yeah, it just reminded me of like the the chocolate factory, right? Where he 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 he's a really reclusive figure. No one knows about him. He's very powerful, and then he lets the kids in, and then at the very end tells Charlie what this has all really been about. Yeah, and I and he wants someone he, to take over. Yeah, exactly. And in the whole way he played this just reminded me of like Willy Wonka telling. Charlie, Loki, and Sylvie, you made it to the end, kids. You won. You made mm-hmm. it to the end, and here's where I hand off the mantle, albeit in a very twisted way. But it that was one reminder. The other characters he reminded me of, these were totally random, was, do you remember the dude who drove the cab in Total Recall? Yeah. <laughs> to the robot. There's yeah, something yeah. about the way he was moving and talking that reminded me of that guy. <laughs> I got five kids to feed. I, I just like, I, I don't know why that kept coming in my head, but it was like this random mix. And then the other one was there's, uh, he reminded me actually of the Ferengi from Star Trek Next Generation and DS9, who are also kind of, you know, well, sometimes harmless, but definitely, you know, crafty characters, always kind of up to, up to no good and mischief. I don't know if that was a deliberate choice, but those were the three things that like just visually, um, came to mind watching him move and talk and kind of smile and all the ticks that he had. Mm. And what was your reaction to that? Because like to me, it was very jarring. Like I don't know exactly what I expected Can to look and sound like initially, exactly. but it was like I did not see that coming. I liked it, but I didn't see it coming. I don't. I didn't know. Listen, I enjoyed the performance. I didn't know too much what to think about it at first. I was a little bit yes thrown off, but. It was very matter of fact in terms of his delivery and how he was saying it. It reminded me a little bit of the Joker and Heath Ledger's performance. Yeah, a little bit of that too. Um, a lot of purple as well. Yeah. It looked like the Joker a little bit with the <laughs> get up. Yeah. Like a yeah. suit, but like kind of not a real suit. Yeah. It, had, it definitely had the colors. Yeah. But. That's why I said I've watched it over and over again just to see how. And it, again, if you compare to how you've seen the Kangs in 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 uh, cartoons, yeah, he's more above everything. You know, he's like he's more spaceman. Yeah, like he's got his helmet. Like you know, it's exactly. Just, we don't know yeah. what we'll get. Again, yeah. this is just one iteration. We may get some form of that in in future iterations of Kang, um, which I'm looking forward to. But when you think about who Immortus is, he's, you know, the guy at the end of the 
end of it all, he doesn't have a lot of conversations with anybody and, and he's just, you know, giving him the explanation and he's just, you know, it's hard to explain for me, but it was entertaining nonetheless. And the switches he made when he was being super serious. Yes. Um, he already cool. was playing it like more characters within one. Yes. And when he was yelling at uh, Sylvie, get over, uh, get over it, right? Yeah. yeah. Hypocrite. Yeah. Murderer. Yeah. yeah. You know? Uh, he definitely reminded me of Joker when he, uh, when he said, we've all done horrible uh uh yeah you know what i'm saying uh horrible we can do terrible it for things reason. yeah yes so yeah. it was it was just a a, a great performance on, on on by him i i wanted to ask you regarding miss minutes do you think he set in motion a series of events that with verona in giving miss minutes some direction on what to do if certain things happen by giving her these files that she wasn't expecting because she asked for something she she asked for something specifically and she didn't get that but Miss Minutes said something to the effect that these might help or you know what I'm saying so I I think there's some there may be some uh, I don't know if it's MacGuffin that they call it or whatever but it, it's some some something that'll come out in 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 obviously in uh um later uh in season two who knows or in i guess perhaps maybe the resolution of this all so miss minutes actually matters a lot i think that's one thing the way this season left things and her role in the final episode i think it's important to go back to the early episodes and understand that when she's giving them the tutorial of how the multiverse works, now we understand that's propaganda. Yes. That's Kang authored propaganda. Mm -hmm. So you can't totally take that now at face value, given we know she's kind of his hench person. Correct. You definitely walk out of the season finale with the idea that Ravona is more pawn than judge. In this, mm -hmm. which is, a, you know, in the comics, she, they're always connected. I feel like in the comics, sometimes she's more elevated as almost not his equal, but more in on the joke, if you will, yeah. with him. Whereas here, she's his love interest in the, in the comics. Yeah, but here it does seem like there's an innocence there of like she's a true believer in everything that TVA stood for and is kind of being played um, by Miss Minutes, in addition to Kang. I mean, Miss Minutes actually is channeling Kang. That's kind of what it looks like to me. Mm -hmm. like, I, if we go forward into season two and if we see Miss Minutes, I'm going to basically assume she's speaking with Kang's voice almost every time she opens her mouth. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, you know, that's, and I don't think Ravona realizes that at all. So we know that she doesn't. How does yeah. that get kind of unearthed? Yeah. Mobius clearly senses it. He doesn't know about Kang specifically, mm -hmm. but he clearly senses there's this layer beyond where they are now. So, but if Mobius, this version of Mobius may already know who Kang is based on the statue that Loki sees at the end. So we might get a little bit of insight. We may not see in season two. Um, well, it'll be interesting to see what Mobius has to say about Kang. Um, if he is indeed called Kang or a timekeeper, who knows? You know, I also give Hiddleston credit in this episode. I mean, he still is far and away the MVP of the show. I don't even think it's really worth the discussion. But I think it's it says a lot that you can be the headliner and the star, but you can back off in the finale, which is really what he did. I yes. mean, he basically, he has his moment with Sylvie in the office. But even in the office, he does the least talking of the yes. three. It's Sylvie who says... You're lying. You're lying over and over again. He's basically just sitting there listening. And then at the end, you know, he, he has the one mini duel and then he's banished mm -hmm. and he has his one run to find Mobius who has a couple of lines at the very end, like I said, very much like Planet of the Apes. Mm -hmm. And that's it. Hiddleston is really not that present in this finale. And I think that's credit to him to basically say, I don't need to be the show. 
in this episode. No. Yes. And then we found out afterwards he's going to be Loki a lot longer because he's going to be in Doc Strange too. And he exactly. said, you know, I'm, I'm going to do this as long as they let me do it. Yeah, man. Um, again, once, listen, you become world renowned when you're dealing with Marvel. I almost from the onset, if this is being, you know, if everyone is talking about this from around the world, you know, and how, based on how popular these shows are, everyone knows who you are. Again, like I said in the in the, in the previous show, this, you know, if you're in Marvel, your career jump starts. And Todd, Tom Hiddleston's um, star power, you know, was already established in previous films and this is even you know it'll be interesting to see how busy he's going to get uh hopefully it doesn't disrupt his 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 uh, appearances in marvel but i give him credit because i think a lot of actors seek to distance themselves from the role that made them i think you see like i think about like you know vin diesel in the fast and the furious franchise he was too good to come back in two and three you know two and three until the end Mm -hmm. and then he came around after his career elsewhere didn't really become maybe what he hoped it would be he came back around and realized listen dom toretto is what people know me for and that's i've got to go back to that yeah hiddleston under seems to understand whatever else he does in life he's always going to be loki and you know what that's okay that's not a bad thing embrace that and find, and I said, my biggest fear with this show was that he would sully the legacy of the character he had built for 10 years. And I uh-huh. stand corrected because yeah. he found a way to reinvent the character as this sympathetic, um, very much so, you know, empathetic character that is now much more in the hero mold than the villain mold and is seemingly quite small and almost the victim of what's been, you know, he, he like I said, yeah, he, he's, very he's much a so. small man in the giant world. And, and I think that makes you excited to see where that goes next. So I actually, I actually was thrilled to see him say publicly, he's like, no, I, I'm going to keep, do- like, I love doing this and I'm going to keep doing it. And I'm not afraid to be known as Loki basically for the next 20 years. Yeah. Like how many of us, you know, have been in the same job for over 20 years, <laughs> right. you know, um, and some of us choose to do something else because they don't enjoy what they're doing or they want to try something different and it's okay. But in, you know, in this world, especially with Todd, you get to be something different. And, and, and the Loki that we initially saw in, in the previous films is the, is not the same Loki that we're seeing now in this show. Um, will we eventually get back to the Loki of old? Perhaps, which would be a cool sort of twist, right? And I think we might get that at some point. We did get the moment, actually, though, that that I had speculated, which was he effectively was being offered a chance to rule. He was effectively being given his dream. Yeah. And he turns it down, which is the, the greatest sort of display of how much he's changed. Now, what did you think of Sylvie in this episode and the ramifications of her decision to effectively choose revenge over, you know, the, the bigger picture? I think that sense of revenge was overwhelming um, um, for her. And there was essentially, although he made a fantastic case, uh, Immortus did, Kang. Hence, uh, Loki's, Tom Hiddleston's Loki, you know, told Sylvie like, yo, what he's saying, I don't. He don't think he's lying about what he's saying. I don't think there was any. I don't think there wasn't anything that he could say to convince her to chill out. I agree. Uh, her mind was made up the second yeah. she was sitting at the desk. Yeah. yeah, and I think it could be that at that moment is where things changed. For although he had everything written out, he might have known that. At some point, okay, Sylvie's gonna kill me, and at that, and that's where he couldn't see past, and realize that things started branching off. It, it's listen. There's just so much to look forward to. 
for the future of the MCU. Hopefully Kevin and his parliament team continue to talk and have these conversations to make sure things aren't go crazy that we're, we're scratching our heads because we haven't had that feeling as of yet. And things are going to get a lot crazy. I think, I think it sets up Sylvia as a really interesting character, though, because I feel like a lot of times in these shows, you always have that moment of kill or not kill. And usually the protagonist holds back at the last minute. And so I think the fact that they actually had her go through with it, yeah. and the way I liked it, there was no big explosion. There was no, he just, he's dead. He doesn't yeah. say any cheap last line. He just, she so stabs he, him and it's he, over. He just says, I'll see you soon. <laughs> but then you see the timeline start to splinter. And it's like, now she has to deal with the ramifications of having been responsible for that moment. Like all the damage that comes out of that uh, basically can be traced back to that decision now. Yeah. So I think that makes her interesting in the way that you know i speculated last time it, yeah if they were to make you know florence Pugh kill jeremy renner in the hawkeye show, it's that same idea of like this seminal moment that you have to then cope with in future shows so yeah. i was pleased to see they did it like they went through and even though as we know you know he's, she's only killing one of a billion gangs basically yeah. but, but um yeah no i i think i think i will say last point for me is really just I do think this show really benefited from already knowing it had season two. Cause I don't think you could write this episode the way they did. If they were sort of like, we don't really know if these characters are coming back. So I, in a way that WandaVision and Falcon winter soldier were treated as series finales, even though the characters will live on. Mm -hmm. I do think this show really benefited from already knowing before they wrote the end of this season, that there would be another season to come back to these characters in this world. Yeah. Yeah. Hiddleston's <sighs> winning an Emmy, though. I know we'll talk in our new show, we're going to talk about Emmys for the other shows. <laughs> I think he's winning next year. Oh, yeah. He has to. He's definitely going to be nominated. I think he might yes. win. Yes. I, 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 I would be disappointed if he didn't. Um, but we'll talk about definitely about these Emmy awards and, 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 and some surprising ones. But yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, this Loki series opened the door to a whole bunch of stuff. And this was, and I, and, you know, and I'll say this, you know, this is, this goes back to a conversation that um, if you've watched our earlier shows where Tracy said, this is going to open the door to everything, anything goes, you know, so I got to give him a, a shout out for that. But um, I, listen, Brian, I am I'm more excited than this for this than than I am for you know and 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 the excitement that I had for Infinity War and Endgame and how this would end was was big. This has um, definitely gone over that that excitement, and I'm looking so much forward to the new stuff that's going to come, especially Doctor Strange two. Doctor Strange two. Um, what do you, okay, last topic. Then before mm -hmm. we, what do you, having seen this show, knowing that Loki is now going to be in Doc Strange two and what's becoming a very ensemble picture, all the comments that are being made, you know, about how dark and scary. I think Elizabeth Olsen this week used the phrase "old Sam Raimi," which is an Evil Dead reference as far mm -hmm. as how the the mood of of this movie. What do you want from that film? at this point like what would be satisfying to you because that's looking like an enormous picture at this point it's tough to say because it's tough to say because i don't know what i'm going to see right i have absolutely no idea I know they're going to be dealing with this multiverse and the ramifications of what had transpired in, in the, in the season, in the season finale of Loki, but I don't know what we're going to get. I have no clue. Um, but I'm excited to see what they do give us. It's hard for me to really, I'm looking forward to the interactions between Loki and Dr. Strange. Obviously there's going to be some uh, interaction between those two and how they'll first react to each other when they first see each other. Um, I'm also interested, interested in seeing the reaction that Dr. Strange has to all this and what his knowledge base is all this. That's why I asked you before, what do you think 
Doctor Strange knows about the multiverse. So I'm well, just you, well, I, you I, have I, main I, yeah. So it's interesting. You have you have three main characters who have been in the MCU you know, basically since 2015. Loki, obviously, earlier than that, who have never really interacted. Yeah. So Benedict Cumberbatch. Elizabeth Olsen and, and Tom Hiddleston have never really Interact. had scenes where it was about them. Yeah. And in fact, basically that looks like what we're going to get, you know, in some form or fashion in this movie. And those are probably some of the stronger actors in, in, in the lineup. So, uh, and then it sounds like maybe Catherine Hahn back as well. Um, Kevin seemingly hinting at that. Uh, and then we know there's got to be probably another villain you know, we've heard some rumors, but, you know, something related to the Darkhold clearly is going to come into that movie. Um, the kids so much. Yeah. I mean, it's like it's a huge board right now for that for that film. That's why it's like you don't really need an Avengers movie when you have movies like this and Spider-Man three in your in your pipeline. Yeah, it, it, that's why an Avengers level event film will obviously only come to us in theaters and uh, they'll be just bigger and bigger because of what just transpired. Cause we don't know what this, these branching offs of these timelines are going to bring out. Obviously we're going to get uh, a different version of Kang that's going to be more sinister and, and more evil. We don't know what that's going to look like. Obviously it's going to be different from what we just currently, or what we just have um, currently seen. I bet but, he's not in Doc Strange 2 that much. I bet he's no. in no more than he was in this show. I think he's in that movie. I think this movie will probably be more managing these situations. He might not even be in it at all. Like he might be more inferred, yeah. implied, shadowy he, figure. He'll be yeah. Kang will most likely be what we expect for this uh series finale, Reed. season finale Reed. would be like a cutscene. But ladies and gentlemen, this has been a discussion of the Loki uh, se season finale episode and what to expect in Doctor Strange soon in multiverse, multiverse of Madness. I'm excited. Five star show, I'm assuming. Oh, yeah. Do we even have to talk about it? Yeah. It's <laughs> There's people we're both we're both so wrong on this show and it's a five star I, I, I show and it's the best I, show by I, far. I, I know, I know, right? It's crazy, but you know, there's still people that think that WandaVision is their number one show. Listen, WandaVision no. was certainly a different no. type of show, but it was no Loki show. This no the, the ramification of this show affects everything. That's why Marvel themselves said that this movie, Kevin himself, that this movie will have more implications going forward for the MCU. Not WandaVision. And not to say that WandaVision was a bad show or was a decent show. It was a great show. It was a good show. But it was hard to get into in the beginning because of what how they went about it. That's the reason why it was only 30 minutes per episode. Because you can't watch an hour of this. And the ending was still net-net a little disappointing. Exactly. This, this show had one lull, which was 35 minutes in the middle, where you understand the purpose of it, but it wasn't amazing. It had five excellent excellent to transcend it episodes this was prestige television i had you know yeah i, I can't get over how good the writing was. that's why i'm like michael waldron to me is like the new hero i'm so stoked oh, yeah. he's like involved with doc strange 2 and star wars and like like he anything like that that brother stuff. writes you're gonna want to watch yeah anything that he's involved in you're gonna want to watch but that's our show for today um, thank you for joining us once again. Please ha hit that like and subscribe button, hit the notification bell, share with your friends. It really does help support the channel. It really does. It really does. So, uh, comment in the comment section and, and hit, do hit that like. Um, I'm afraid to ask, but Brian, any last words? <laughs> no, I mean, it's funny, lot. like, yeah, yeah, it's funny, but it's just like you know, it's almost an afterthought. We're like, yep, five stars, Hillston MVP, probably going to get an Emmy. Like, it says a lot when you get to the end of a show and you kind of, it's like a yeah, foregone conclusion as to how good it was. But I think, yeah, I just think Marvel is learning about how to do television. And I think this was a quantum leap forward in terms of how they might think about future shows, future writing, scripting, approach. I just think it was a groundbreaking moment for them. 
Mm -hmm. um and so i'm super duper excited to see where we where we go from here and where we go from here honestly is is uh what if which i think is also has the potential to be an incredible show it's yeah. totally different yeah um before we, we 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 sign out i just want to let everyone know to stay tuned to our discussion in one of, in our nerd gen report which we'll be having soon um regarding um the 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 DC universe and how different it might uh, be looking uh, going forward and how the structure of it all is um, and what some of these things mean um, with regards to DC wanting to do what Marvel does. There's very, there's a very uh, specific thing. It's not doing um, the formula of Marvel, but there's a formula that that's being used in Marvel that DC is, gonna, is looking to emulate and we'll discuss that in our next episode It's going to be a very different a very uh interesting conversation and we look forward to seeing you guys all there and um we'll see you next time on another gen report thank you